Yes, yes. Yeah. Go to the start menu. Go. To, there's no start menu. Um, just IP config release. Oh, hello. Oh. I didn't see you there. I was just helping Scott Goo with a Wi-Fi problem. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Mm, that's yummy. Because that's how it happens. Because that's exactly <laughs> what happens. Just Anders is on the phone. And is Help me with my subnet, Scott. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about mobile. Building for the mobile web. Awesome. Yes. It's lovely. And you, actually, you helped me with this. And you did this at TechEd a little I while I did back. last yeah. year, yeah. This is to lovely. 1,300 people. Did you really? Was a big there talk. are like 3,000 lovely people yeah, here. They're right going to enjoy now. this. All right. Let's go to the slides. Building for the mobile web. Here's where we are. After this, it's going to be Signal R, which is really why everyone came today. Oh, let's face it. To, to see that's you. why I came. That's why I'm here. <laughs> all the rest, all of it was just prelim. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about adaptive rendering, but I want to get right into the more interesting stuff. Right. Uh, we'll talk about display modes, look a little bit at the mobile template, and what jQuery mobile means to us, right. and how it uh, changes how we write stuff. And then also talk about maybe some of the other ones that are out there. jQuery mobile a great start. Mm -hmm. But there's Sencha and there's Kendo and yep. on and on and on. So and understand that this is a just scratching the surface of some of the cool stuff that you can do with mobile. So we pretty much all agree that mobile is becoming, for a lot of people, the primary way that people browse the web. Or even the only way. That's exactly true. Yeah. Uh, and it's completely changed the way that I uh, use the toilet. I don't know what we did in there before. Uh, uh, magazines, mean, maybe? Yeah, Newsweek. Newsweek. Reader's Digest. Do you have that in Australia? We have those little things on the back of the door, like funny quirks, like tell you, teddy bears, right, top, top yeah. ten tips. Or we something. have Reddit. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. So, your point though about mobile only is really interesting. You can see in this slide here that there is a about a quarter of the U.S. is mobile only. These are people who've never had a computer. Right. And I actually saw an update to these stats last week that mm. now tips us over thirty percent in the U.S. Mm, mm, which is, mm. I mean, we're getting up to like a full third of the population. That means that the, the, the quad processor pocket supercomputer right. in their pocket is their only machine. Is their only computer. Which is really interesting because it gets you thinking about larger machines like the Galaxy Tab. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why would you want this freakishly large phone? Right. But they never talk on it. This is true. Right. It's, it's, the, it's the dream of Star Trek, the next generation. Yeah. It is the It's the little device, tab, right? the, yeah. the little pad that they walk around with. Yeah. Why do I need a computer? Ex exactly. Exactly. And in places like Egypt, as much as 70% of the population yeah, that's crazy. is doing this. That's it's amazing. pretty amazing. And don't you appreciate the uh, innovation that has occurred since the iPhone has been you know, mind blowing, really. It's, it's so creative. Uh, you can see why it was knighted, obviously. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just incredible. See, truly, we all just wanted a black slab. Yeah. No innovation. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you have a site, what can you do to make it work on mobile? Well, nothing. That is one thing you could do. Yeah. Literally do nothing. And for a lot of news sites, you'd be surprised. Just to how well that works for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some people really do that as a strategy. They just hope that the mobile browsers are going to get better. Now, one thing you could do, though, is you could change the client side to adapt. You can use these responsive design techniques. Right. We'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Maybe go over some of the things that we saw earlier in the day. Or you could target mobile directly. And we're going to show an example of that today as we move a site from the desktop over to uh, a mobile by serving entirely different uh, HTML. And this was the way that we did things in the in the WAP WML days. Oh, do you remember your first WML app? I think we all remember our first. I wrote a WML app that interfaced with Exchange pre-2000. So mm. oh, No, it was Exchange 2000. No, it was pre-2000. It was Exchange 5.5, I think it was back then. And I wrote a WML app that let you log in. That was 13 uh, read years your ago. Email. Yeah, it was 99. <laughs> <laughs> and read your email, look up uh, ca contacts from the gallery. I remember that on a little um, Nokia black and white 7110 phone. Yes. with a little scroll wheel. We are really old. We are very old. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this, there's this continuum between adaptive rendering, picking display modes, kind of changing parts of the page, or going all the way mobile. It's right. up to you. And it depends also on whether you're not trying to make a website or web application. Right. A dedicated mobile experience. Like really thinking about, hey, this person's not at their computer right now. What are they probably going to be wanting to do? And optimizing the experience for that. Right. Exactly. So here's our buddy Phil Hack. Uh, this is his blog, uh, When We Do Nothing. I, I, I've been doing this demo for almost a year, yeah. just hoping that Phil will update his blog. <laughs> so it's a public shaming of my wonderful friend. 
Uh, but he's, he's too busy doing really good work at, yeah. uh, at GitHub. So that's what happens when you do nothing. But what's the first thing that you're going to do when you visit Phil's blog on this phone? Well, other than put on my glasses, I'm probably going to tap, tap. Tap, tap. Right. Exactly. Well, you can set up what's called a viewport tag. I get what you did there. You, get the, you like what I said? <laughs> I get you like what you that? did there. Let's see if anybody else did. <laughs> you can set up a viewport tag and set the width. Oh, look. I didn't set the viewport on this slide. <laughs> oh, yes, there we go. All this is is a single line of HTML that allows you to control the width, nice. effectively removing that initial tap tap. So, are you saying that the mobile device, even though the, you know, the physical resolution of my, my Nokia 920 I have here might be, what, 768 pixels across, it's lying? by default and say, no, I'm going to render like I'm actually a desktop, which is why everything goes really, really, really And, and this small. becomes more complicated with retina displays. Right. If you take my, uh, you know, a, a blog that is not uh, mobile enabled and you take a retina and a non-retina device mm -hmm. with the same size screen, they're going to render about the same size. Right. But at the same time, the browser developers could have said, oh, I'll render it dot for dot. Yes. And done them 100%. And then the retina one would have looked really zoomed out. Right. So they are using kind of a logical uh, measuring right. technique. <clears throat> you get to con control right. what you want this to look so that's like. That's this whole viewport. What is the concept? initial viewport right. of your site? Right. This is extremely the least you can do. Right. Uh, I'm trying, this is like le almost less than nothing. Right. Okay. But that's Phil's blog with that single line added. Interestingly, Interesting. that doesn't mean that I can't move his blog around. Right. It just saved me that initial experience and made me not hate him. So all that's really happened here is now that you're telling the browser to behave like it's a physical set of pixels across, it'll lay out stuff according to the rules of CSS. Right. And, those and this just happened to work for what he right. was doing. Of course. But the interesting thing about Phil's blog is that that right rail uh -huh. would be the thing that I would move. Right. Anyway. And there's two ways to do that. You could either remove it, mm -hmm. or uh, which, which, which is what I do on my blog, mm -hmm. or put it underneath. Like inline it. Inline it, exactly. Yeah. And inline it then brings up the question, well, do you take like Phil's head and put it at the top, and then an ad mm -hmm. and put it down? Uh, or, and on my blog, I just remove the ads. But it's one of those things you have to balance out. My blog gets about 10% uh, iPhone, Android users. Right. So it's a big number, but it's not a huge enough number that I'm really worried about it. Right. Um, it's enough to make me make, uh, take action. But I'm not like TechCrunch, where they insist on a crappy mobile app right. rather than making a mobile site. A decent mobile experience. Right. And I've, yeah. I've been going on about this for years. I mean, no one wants to have, you know, you're on the toilet, and I'm on the toilet, and I text you a link, and then you click on it, and it says, click, oh, redirecting to M dot, oh, I'm going to see the mobile, oh, download our app. Oh, yeah. Nice. Download our app. Just tease me the whole way, yeah. and then oh, kick no, me no. the face. Just continue on to the mobile <laughs> site. Yeah. And where are you? The home page. Right. Not at the page itself. Yeah. And then we're both sat on the toilet. It's awful. <laughs> now, <laughs> sorry, it's late in the day, and the poop references are going to continue to fly. <laughs> or, or you can change the client. We talked about this a little bit with adaptive rendering. So in this example here, I've got uh, the ASP.NET website mm -hmm. sitting right here. And uh, that is also how a number of sites do it. Let's take a look. Let's try some sites, shall we? New York Times. They detected that I had Chrome. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they're doing something funky. Very nice. CNN. Yeah, not so much. Not so much. ASP.NET. Right. Microsoft.com. And even there, you can see some are more ah, granular. That's a others, really excellent right? point that you're making. There's basically one breakpoint right. here. That one. That's a weird one. It, like, it responds once. There. Yep. And that right there is because that's the height of an iPad on, on um, Portrait. Right. That's where we decided a good place to do it. So here's this one. Oh, look at that. See, that's... So look. But watch. This is really important. It's continual. No, but it's, it's different depending oh, on what that. you're doing. Yeah, it's cool. They did a nice job. This was a recent thing. So they've got what's called a hero banner here. That's kind of what in the design world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then see this chunk of text here? There's a breakpoint there. Mm -hmm. That's one. Yep. Mm, there's that's one. Two. Yep. There's one. And then the menu went away. Yep. But notice what they did with that. See how he's very wide there? Yes. They zoomed in on him and clipped him. Yeah, change, yeah, yeah. And then look at the menu. See this menu right here? Oops. Let me try that again. Zoom in. Boom. And now the menu is yeah, very right impressive. there. That's very nice. That's what you want to be able to do. The point is that when people show up, and, and I just got to pound this in people's heads. Tell your boss, tell your friends, if I show up on your website, 
I want to see your website. I don't want to see your lousy mobile app. You can put a little banner at the top and tell me you have one, mm -hmm. but don't bother me again. Mm -hmm. If I get a link, I don't want to go and be redirected to your lousy homepage. Right. Show me your content. Now, this is for web sites. Mm -hmm. Twitter is in an interesting place because right. they're really an app. Yeah. So I could see them offering a richer experience. Mm -hmm. And you know, the New York Times has the ability to like save things. Mm -hmm. But at what point does HTML5 allow you to do things like save offline? Mm -hmm. And maybe they could have gotten away without an app. Right. At what point is it simply a branding decision? Right. Right. We need an app. But even within the scope of a single site like Twitter.com, mm -hmm. you can imagine what would people what would people be likely to share? Well, an individual tweet is very likely to be shared. So <laughs> When you visit Twitter by getting, uh, going through a link that was an individual tweet, you don't really want to enter an app experience at that point. You just want to read the tweet and then get out of there. Right. And they, they do optimize for that if you kind of look at how they do that. I, I get to the tweet, there it is, it loads, and then I can get out of there. That's an interesting point. They're optimizing not just for the, the, the act of sharing, right. but then the, when it gets shared, the email, context whatever, I'm coming the context that you come in right. there. Exactly right. Now, you could also change the server entirely. That means you're going to notice that you're on mobile, and you're going to re return them something that's totally different. Right. So we're going to spend some time uh, doing exactly that. So what we're going to do, we're going to take this app here. This is an app that our buddy Steve Sanderson made for us. So here's, an, here's a conference browser. This is using the old style template. Uh, template. I wanted to use the old style template because I don't want this to resize. Ah, yes. See? The old style template would have given me too much by, for free. Right. So you see how that's lousy. Yeah. Not a great experience. I could bring that up in an emulator if I wanted to. In fact, you notice how I can come over here. I'm zoomed in. And I've got, like, like I said before, the guys yes. from Electric Plum. These guys are awesome. I could say iPhone Simulator. This is basically a custom build of Chromium embedded Inside, a skin. inside of a skin, right. but it actually, uh, the, the premium version of this, you can get a, a free version with Web Matrix. The premium version of this that you can buy has geolocation and stuff oh, where you nice. can actually tell it to lie. Right. You can like, click on a map and say, I'm here, have my app behave a certain way. So this is not a good experience. This is what my app looks like on a mobile device. Right. You know, more or less in that case. And of course, I could then use Browser Stack if I wanted to go and look at it on an Android or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> now. Our layout here is a kind of a standard layout. Nothing fancy here. I'm just using regular jQuery. This is an old version of jQuery because I'm using an old version of jQuery mobile. I'm going to click on the Don't Lie to Me button. That one. Yep. And I'm going to pull in this layout mobile. What I've done is I've actually brought in jQuery.mobile.mvc. It's a NuGet package. The package is here. Okay? Yep. And this brings in jQuery Mobile. This is something that Steve did. And this is some helpers to make things a little bit easier. And it brings in a, a view switcher mm -hmm. and then a basic layout. So it's just a little bit of a thing to get you get you started. Cool. You can go and do this you know, yourself if you want to. So I bring in layout.mobile. You notice that all we've done is change the name from layout to layout.mobile. It could be layout.foo or layout.bar. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. And I could take layout.mobile and change it so it's entirely different. This is a totally different HTML document. We've got jQuery mobile bundles coming in. And we saw bundling earlier, slash bundle slash jQuery. That's going to pull that content and grab all that jQuery mobile stuff into this. Then, I'm just going to toss this for the purposes of this demo and just go foo, okay? Mm -hmm. And look at this in the iPhone. Oh, never called render body. I'll just go like that. Okay. okay. So I'm getting a different experience. Very basic. Right. It's gray, it doesn't have menus and stuff like that. But I can add stuff. So we're adding some annotations here, we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we'll add maybe some text here to indicate that we really are mobile. Okay. See, right here? Yep. 
So this is beginning to be themed by jQuery Mobile. These are where I think things are really interesting. And this is a, a uniquely jQuery Mobile thing. Everyone's different. We could have said div class equals my custom mobile class right. or whatever. We could have done this entirely ourselves. We don't need jQuery Mobile. This is a really important thing for people to remember. Mm -hmm. You don't need Sensha. If you want to write all this stuff yourself, you can. Go for it, absolutely. But you could also stand on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. So that's kind of what I'm choosing to do here. So I'm declaring that not class equals this or class equals that, but I'm using these data hyphen something right. things. These are HTML5 specific attributes. And by saying something here, again, this can be anything. That's what's great about data hyphen jQuery Mobile has decided that, well, this takes the role of a page. This takes the role of a header without indicating what it should look like. Right. And this is something that's kind of uh, a passion of the jQuery Mobile folks, is the idea that theme rolling, or making new themes, is separate from page layout. So again, this is like that semantic meaning inside here. We're not just saying, hey, make this red, or hey, style this with a gradient in the background. I'm saying, this is a header, and then CSS will come along later on and do the job of making it look like how I want a header to look like. Exactly. And for a small site like this, it makes it really easy to read. Right. I've got data roll page, data roll header, data roll content. It's extremely clear right. what's going on there. That's the jQuery mobile vocabulary like we spoke about. Exactly. Before. Taxonomy. 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 All right. So where is this coming from? put useful information about the conference here. Well, if we go into that, this is our home page. So I'm presuming that this is inside of here. index. There we go. Now, I can take index, make a copy of it, OK? And I will name that index.mobile.cshtml. And then open that up. I am so deeply mobile. OK? Awesome. That's mobile. But then we go back over into IE. OK, so now we have a mobile-specific layout page and a content page working together. Exactly. And the fact that they're working together is really significant. So it's good that you brought that up. Because you could decide whether or not you think that's important. Mm -hmm. Do you require your display modes to be consistent? You could have a mobile layout, but the text inside doesn't really matter. Right. So then you could reuse index. Mm -hmm. So we could try doing that. You could right? probably get a long way just with a mobile layout page with some custom CSS. Exactly. Yeah. So let's see if we can actually do that. Let's throw in some um, some navigation. We'll just bring in a, uh, a UL, and I'll add in some links. So this is just going to say, hey, this is mobile. I've got a UL, some links off to other parts of my app. Mm -hmm. And I could reuse this. This is not jQuery. It's well, it's just right, a exactly. Series just of contained links. at this point. Right. So, what does that look like over here? Well, you know, it looks kind of okay, but you know, mm -hmm. it's not going to win any design awards. Yep. It's not really cool. But what else could I do? I could potentially make that uh, prettier. We could say data role list view, saying that this is taking on the role of a of a uh, list view. I could say uh, data role. I believe it's list divider. If I get that right, still looks kind of cheesy. Mm -hmm. um, I could say uh, data. I think it's data inset equals true. Interesting. Yeah. Look so at things that. are a little, a little, little prettier. Yeah. I'll actually bring this over and make sure I got it right. It's list hyphen divider. You just have to read the docs. There we go. See how Browse by changed its color? So you're basically like, specifying widget names almost here. Like. Close. You're saying that this is a list view, right. but you, the, 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 what it looks like is still being handled so by the theme. So the behavior theme. of the side of the widget is specified here, yes. but the way it looks is going to be handled until some way else. That's exactly right. I can go over to the layout here, and you see this data theme? Ah. Try A instead of B. Right. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Or C. And that Very data cool. theme there is actually configurable. So I can go over to the theme, the jQuery Mobile Teams theme roller. Check this out. And I could describe how I want things to look. Uh. So I'm going to pick up color. And using some you know, many years of design experience, <laughs> come up with, uh, I think it's we time. We the 70s, you know, it's, it's actually time to bring, <laughs> time bring, bring hot dog back. <laughs> My eyes. Right? But check this out. This is what's great about these guys. 
me and John called him up and said, hey, downloading zip files of that's fine, but what I really want is a NuGet file. Oh, wow. So, you know, gimme. We'll call it hot dog. Hot, hot dog, there you go. <laughs> and then say download NuGet. I can bring that down, name it as a new package, and then nice. install a package, and then it can be used by my entire team. That's impressive. And then I get a uh, hot dog. So it's really nice. So you get that kind of added benefit by right. able to use the jQuery mobile right. theme roller. And going back to your point about um, sharing content there, those data dashes do nothing by themselves. I mean, you could have those data dash attributes in the same content page exactly. that's used in the desktop browser, and it's not going to look any different Let's try because that. your layout page is the thing that's adding the jQuery mobile specific logic of those of that vocabulary. Exactly right. About. Let's actually try that. We'll come over here, and this is the non-mobile version of the page, and I will say, I am a fat desktop. There you go. Just looks right. like a desktop. So page. effectively, I could share these views if you I could. wanted to. Right. You can get as dry as you want, but yep. at some point, though, interactions start to dictate. Dictate things. exactly. Right. <clears throat> so, this looks pretty nice, and in very, very little effort, just to to review, all we did, we put in our little viewport, of course. We brought in the jQuery Mobile CSS, jQuery Mobile bundles. You can pull that stuff in. That's all in a NuGet package. That we've set some data roles. And another thing that's interesting to point out is that these are using really simple bits of markup. Right. This is not a complicated tags. Right. Divs, ULs, LIs, A for anchor. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. It's the stuff you know already. It's the stuff that's you know already, point. and that's nice. And, and this is going to allow, I think, a lot of people to uh, leave work early. <laughs> Just look at all the work I look did Look at all today. the work I, I did, I built a mobile app. Yeah, we'll talk about ways you can leave work early later, too. Nice. So if I click on, um, uh, you know, something like, looks like the, the speakers list. So there we are sharing, we're sharing. That that may or may not be, be be, be awesome. Right. I wouldn't say that. So that's we have pretty. one speakers content page right now. Exactly. Okay. If I if I go to speakers, all speakers, add something. Go back here. Go back there. Refresh them both. Right. It's pretty clear that we're using the same things. But if this one is desktop, I could take all speakers if I wanted to, make a copy of it, name it dot mobile. Not anything fancy here. Then, what did we call these things before? Uh, list view, is that what it was? All right, data roll, list view. There's mobile, there's, there's not mobile. So just by virtue of the fact that it has an LI with an action link, an action link, of course, is just the HTML helper in MVC that is used to do an A, an anchor. Right, off to some controller action, mm -hmm. hence the name. So suddenly things are getting pretty nice. But I'm really not enjoying spending time in this, um, this mobile emulator here. Right. And I notice here that I've got displaying mobile view over here, I don't really have anything for that. If I click desktop, so now I've just switched to the desktop. Right. But um, pretty much, back. pretty much screwed. Yeah, you're back there now. Can't get back. So where was that coming from? That was this view switcher. Okay. The view switcher is a partial that is really clever, and this comes inside of the uh, jQuery Mobile MVC helper. Right. That package that you made. spoke about. Exactly. And typically, that looks like this. If it's a mobile browser and you're doing a get, because right. this would only matter in a get, on a post you wouldn't worry about it, mm -hmm. put in a div. Are we pretending to be mobile? This is the are we pretending right now. Right. If we are pretending to be mobile, offer to switch them back. Otherwise, offer to put them back to mobile. So we could then potentially take that partial from here and drop it in here somewhere. This is our layout for our desktop. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's mobile, there's desktop. Okay, so it's not showing up. It's, it's showing not. up over here though. Right, yeah. Yeah. Is it time to bust out Fiddler and figure out what's going on? Maybe. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Let's go back here. 
if it's a mobile browser. Ah, look at that. Time for a little C style commenting. Yep. A little sleight of hand. Now we're just saying if it's a get. Right. That's all we care about. Go back over here. There we go. So now we get that. Let's switch to mobile. Now I can play with mobile inside mm. of a maybe perhaps a more competent browser. Right. Use the F12 tools, wander around, see what it looks like. It's it's getting served the mobile stuff. Right. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So we did speakers. Let's see what else we can we can make look look halfway decent. Speakers was easy. You'll notice that there wasn't much going on there. No. And I don't mean to like overstress the the point here, but Themes aside, it's actually rather a lovely little mobile app. Right. Given that there's a UL and a for loop on it. Yeah. You know That's all you had to do, right? So this idea that we can get a lot of work done. Mm -hmm. For very little investment. That we can get a lot of work done for very minimal investment is really everything. It's significant. At this point, your boss looks at this list of speakers and they say, Wow, you know, that's great, good job, nice job, you guys are awesome, but, you know, I was in Quicken, because the boss is always referencing Quicken, and I, they were doing this type ahead, autocomplete thing. You know, it would be really nice if we had kind of a, as I type on my phone, it filters the list dynamically. This is where you, as the developer, and you have to work with me, developers, you have to go like this. Oh, man, um, yeah, okay, so autocomplete dynamic filtering of a large, chunk of data, um, probably a week. I'm going to need to probably go home and think about that for a while. Yeah. You have to work. You really yeah. got to work it. You got to work it yeah. if you're going to do it. That's right. So then you working from home. And then you go here inside of the UL and you say data dash filter equals true. Thing. And you come back a week or two later. Another Mai Tai? Yeah, yeah. Another, <laughs> another Mai Tai. Exactly. And you come back a week or two later and you say, look, boss, it's amazing. You know, it took a lot of research and development. Absolutely. I'm really pretty tired. Absolutely. I'm going to need to take a week off. <laughs> to recover. To recover from the effort that I did. This is a really great example of what a good mobile framework would do. Absolutely. J this is, again, a jQuery mobile example, but every mobile framework has these cool things. Yeah infinite scroll features. I think Sensha is really known for their infinite scroll. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you do it right, you set up this callback, you set up this div, mm -hmm. we'll handle it because Absolutely. they're seeing these metaphors. Even uh, more lately I've been seeing frameworks with things like pull to refresh yeah. as part of the HTML experience. Yeah. So things like this are a really great ways to make a, a rich feeling application that almost at this point doesn't even look like like it's a web app, like anymore. a web app at right, all, exactly. and, and it doesn't feel like a web no. app, and that's that's kind of what we want to do. So we made tags. Let's go. Um, we made speakers. Let's do the same thing with tags. So we take tags, copy it. These are the tagged sessions within our little mini conference here. I'm gonna just make it mobile. Data role list view. Okay. Tags. If I had a touch screen, I'd do my little touch, Inertial my scroll. Fl flippy touch thing. Yeah. We've got speakers with filtering. Then dates. Mm. So dates looks like blah. Looks like dates. But dates is also a little bit more of an interesting problem because we've got a lot of repeated stuff. Yeah. And on mobile, you have less, less, less space than you do on desktop, mm -hmm. but you're also thinking about the aesthetic. Everyone wants to think about the aesthetic of their app. That's uh, pretty ugly. We want to make that prettier. So it might be more than just wrapping it up in a list view. So what could we potentially do with that? Well, we're in the middle of this for loop, right? We could go and say, well, keep track of the last date and then do something with that. We could break out the date, put the date on one line, put the time on another. Right. And we could even go like this. See, it's got all mad at me now. I'm cheating. I'm pulling stuff in from the, the thing so you don't have to watch me type. There we go. Okay. So what we did here is we just made a method called last day, starting with the default. 
and we say, if this is not the last day, hang on to the last day. And if the date has changed, output a list divider. This almost reminds me of the FizzBuzz type of programming test. It's funny. It's a very you're, similar thing. It's very basic stuff. Yeah. It's incredibly powerful. You have to do it all the time. Yep. If you don't have these basics down, right. exercise that muscle until you have these basics Absolutely. down. Absolutely. This is a classic. If the thing has changed yep. in the middle of a loop, it's you a want conditional to for loop. Basically. Conditional for loop. Yep. Bread and butter, baby. Bam. Didn't compile. <laughs> huh? You love that? You know why it didn't compile? Yeah, I'm going to model decoration. I totally know why. No model decoration. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm going to do that. Beautiful. So I'm going to explain what happened there, because we're, we've done this a million times, and we know how these things break. So let's find out what's going on, actually. I'll just explain it to people. We had no model declaration. So it's saying here, dynamic. And that's the, that's the hint. Right. System, web, MVC, HTML help of dynamic has never heard of an action link because there's nothing hanging off of that. Because if you don't have a model declaration, mm -hmm. it's going to assume you're using a dynamic. That's right. Then some things, if you, and unless you intended to do a dynamic. It's going to fail. It's going to fail. There's no method there or no thing Exactly. There. So that's why, that's why that happened. See? Now, the, the list divider color is set by the theme. It is just taking on that role of being a list divider. Right. Then we did a little culture-specific two-string action. So this would work in French, where we've got small day, small month, little day, hour, minute, and then our AM, PM. Nice. Nice and clean. So that looks pretty darn nice. It's just a grouped list, essentially. It's exactly a grouped Beautiful. list. So date. Now, here's where things get hairy. We click on something, and now we're looking at tables. Right. Oh. And tables are when everything falls apart. Tables and mobile. Yeah, tables and mobile good. don't work. Yeah. Interestingly enough, tables in a in a uh, desktop app, I think, get a bad rap. You know, I mean, if someone's like, "Hey, man, you should have used the div, man," because that's how the div people talk. Right. Um, I don't I think that's fair. That? Yeah, you're totally talking I talk about that. that don't I? That's not fair. Well, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a table of data. Use a table. Nothing wrong with tables for tabular data. Actually, my buddy uh, Pete Brown has this T-shirt that says, "Screw it, I use the table." Use the table. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Loud and proud, Pete. Nothing wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with using a table. Okay, but this is clearly a huge pile of fail. Yeah. Yeah. So where is that coming from? Where is this coming from? This is coming out of sessions. Looks like home slash sessions by date. So we're pulling out this list of sessions. Here's the table. Right. Again, makes total sense for what it does. Not appropriate for mobile. Right. Let's take sessions table. Dot mobile. All that can go away. All this table nonsense. Now I could type it, but you know I can type, or most of you do. We're going to go back and just use our ULs again. Now, here's an interesting trick, though. Once you're inside the LI, at least with jQuery Mobile, it is that LI that represents the item from the top of the list to the bottom of the list. Right. It takes up that full vertical space there. And then it is the A, the anchor, immediately within the LI that causes it to have that, that sense of we're going next, right. going to the right. In here, just using an H3, in H3. Mm -hmm. And through experimentation, we discover that an H3 is a very attractive looking font size. Nice. H1, H2, they're going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. P, our paragraph, is a block tag that is going to be styled a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then strong is literally going to bold it. Right. So even though this is so basic, mm -hmm. it's an anchor. Within it is an H3, mm -hmm. a strong P, and another P. Uh, you'll get a fairly dramatic uh, change. Look at that. And it's worth pointing out, some people who haven't been exposed to HTML5 before may be saying, but wait, the, H, uh, the A tag isn't a block tag. The A tag, I can't put an H3 inside of an A tag because previously that just wouldn't work in mm -hmm. earlier versions of IE. HTML5 actually dictates that A is a content neutral tag. They call it content transparent. And so what happens is whatever's inside the A, the A just says, well, I'm not really in the DOM. Just like when it comes to laying out and doing flow, just ignore me. 
Just mm -hmm. go to the one above me and lay out as if I was that. And so it, the, the, the short of it is you can put anything inside of an A that you like now and it'll be clickable. Right. Definitely not something that the uh, people who've been familiar with things in the past are going to find intuitive. Exactly. But once you do, it makes a lot of sense. All of these things are clickable. This application would kind of be a, a bunch of fail if I clicked on, say, this title, right. but I move the mouse slightly above it, yes. and that was an empty... And if anyone who's ever done that type of development before will have had known all the tricks to turn an A into a block so that you could mm -hmm. click anywhere and the stuff inside the A. Yep. And you or you just A everything. Right. Bloats your code. And then some browsers will go, oh, well, but I'll only let you click on the actual text in the A, not the white space behind the text. And you do all these right. tricks to sort of blow the A up to the full size. That's not a problem anymore. It just works. Exactly. And the reason that this application works so well and so nice is, I think, because of that, that sense of always moving forward. Mm. I can go and say, give me a speaker. Filter that speaker. Click on the speaker. There's a talk that they're doing. Ah, so now we're on a session. This session does not look too yummy. Right. But interestingly, this one has tags. Mm -hmm. There's a date. My name is clickable. So you could see almost being able to move around this cube of, of data. And slicing it different ways. Right. Look at things by date. Look at things by tag. Look at things by person. Mm -hmm. So this one is the session. Right now, it's just a div, a bunch of H3s. Not particularly interesting. I've got a session lying around already that I'm going to pull in that we'll use and then we'll take a look at. So here's our session mobile. Okay. So it takes in a session. Now, just to kind of call back for a moment for people who've been with us all day, and thank you, wonderful people in Europe who are up all night yeah, hanging out with us, indeed. and also for the people in the future who are watching us online. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about MVC and the relationship between MVC and the model, the view, and the controller. The controller in this case is getting that session information and passing it into this view. And line one right there is saying, here is a session. It's receiving that session. We haven't spent too much time exploring this application. But when someone goes and says sessions by speaker or session, look at line 55 there, when we're going to go and get that session, we're going to pass in the code for it, then we're going to say go get a single session and then return that and pass it into the view. Mm. So we're in home session, therefore, as we saw in our event with John there, home session, we're in the home folder, we're getting the session view, and that is then passing a session into the view. Here in our mobile one, we're taking in a session, and at that point, model, that object there, is of type session. Nice. You can actually hover over it and see that, that that is a session. Right. Then I can go and pull stuff off of that, and because that's a strongly typed session, I can grab all that stuff. Nice. So, here our session has H2, and P, and all that kind of stuff, but then we bring in a list view. So we're getting a little more complicated here. We've got some titles, doing some strong text, actually having two list views. One here for the speakers for our talk, mm -hmm. and one down here for the tags for that talk. So let's take a look at this one. So you see how this list view kind of sits nicely on the page like that? Yeah. See this data inset? Brings it off the edges. Yeah. Right. So you can decide the different ways. You can play with these different techniques and see what you want them to look like. But now, because we've done session, tables, speakers, dates, tags, I can move around. Here are all the .NET talks. There's a talk where are all the talks by Stephen. Nice. Et cetera. And this really gets back to what we spoke about at the beginning about you making the choices about when is it appropriate to build a mobile-specific application. Now, in this case, you can imagine I'm walking around the conference floor, I'm looking at sessions, maybe I just came out of a session, I know it was Hanselman, so I go, oh, speakers, Hanselman, I was just in this session. Oh, it was by Hanselman, click on that again. What other sessions is he going to mm -hmm. do because mm -hmm. I'm interested? That's a really specific context type of thing that I'm doing. Now, if I'm sitting at the web browser, it was probably I was doing it the week before, or maybe it's after the, after the talk has happened and I'm now looking for videos. I would go to the full site, I want to see a full table and just sort of browse through. Exactly. So we have two different experiences that are optimized for the context in which the users are using them. So yep. it's a great, great idea to use a different app in this case. Well, it definitely gets you thinking, though, about when does 
uh, an app, when is an app needed? Right. Because one of the things we know at conferences is that the Wi-Fi sucks. Yeah. So you go to a talk, you're walking around, you click on, oh, well, I can't get on the conference Wi-Fi. Well, wouldn't you then say, I probably need to go and get an app? Download it all beforehand. Download you know, right. the app. Uh, certainly, doing things like this would not work out. Having this, this, this uh, desktop version of it is, is no, useless. Yeah. And I just want to point out to conference organizers and user group people, most applications are for loops over pretty basic pieces of data. Yeah. In this instance here, this application is super basic. But here's what people don't, I think, realize. There's not even a database here. <laughs> just a little dirty little secret here. Yep. This is just an XML cube. Yep. And I'll show you another version of this where it's just JSON. I mean, I'm, in, I'm saying this because I want to encourage people to make their apps as simple as possible. We've got for each date, Dates have sessions, sessions have people, sessions have tags, and once you get to any one of those, you can navigate between them. Right. It was so easy for us to go and make a mobile version of this. Why doesn't every conference do that? Or user exactly. do that? Absolutely. Right. It really is right there. We yeah. want to make sure that people know that. Let me try to answer that question, though. How would we do this offline and see if I can find, uh, I believe I've got an offline, since we have the time to talk about it, version of this. While you're looking for that, I'm just going to make a point. We've been doing all of this in MVC, um, which is great. And of course, MVC is mm -hmm. you know, wonderful for the, people, for the people using MVC. I know a lot of you are watching uh, using web forms. In the 2012.2 update that we shipped this week, the ASP.NET and WebTools 2012.2 update, we included something called ASP.NET friendly URLs. And I think you even talked about it this morning very mm -hmm. briefly. Um, friendly URLs actually includes in it support for web forms to do this mobile view switching. And so you could have your you know, sessions.aspx and your sessions.mobile.aspx, and you would have your site.master mm -hmm. and your site.mobile.master, and you can use the exact same techniques that we're seeing here in web forms using the friendly URLs package that's available on NuGet right now um, or in the templates by default in uh, a ASP.NET 2012.2 update. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> <clears throat> so I've actually wanted to show you while you were talking about that. Let's see if this works. We're, we're totally doing our own thing now. While you were talking just now, my friend, uh, we did this, remember that async demo that we did before? Oh, look at that. So here's the same thing except mobile on web forms. And you know, Let's that wasn't even planned. I just wanted to say that. No, I know make you sure did. the web forms people so, had some love. I want to make sure the web forms people look get at that. love. Because web forms people, uh, don't be ashamed. Loud and proud. Like me. Web forms. I'm, for, I'm totally proud of my web, web forms, forms heritage. For web forms heritage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm BB3 from way back, yeah. you know, so I've, yeah, web forms heritage. <laughs> I like that. Well said. So here's the responsive design on the left here. This is yep. the, the async app that we talked about earlier. Right. Okay. This is hitting, let's look at the URL here, slash async. That on a desktop is coming out of here. Right, there it is, async.aspect. Exactly. Yep. But here is the same thing, async.mobile. So we're now in web forms rather than MVC. Mm -hmm. Just by virtue of the fact that it's called .mobile, we're able to see that. Okay. We look in there and we see what? Data roll. Look at that. jQuery mobile. Fantastic. jQuery mobile alongside an ASP.NET repeater yep. and labels and things like that, which is totally cool. Absolutely. So now... Here's the same exact thing on our iPhone simulator. Very cool. Isn't that nice? You yeah. like that? Fantastic. I thought you'd like that. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do little, like that little, a lot. A little, <laughs> little gift for you there. Thank you, thank you. And then, of course, because I was working from home, I went and just, you know. Over my ties. Yeah, Beautiful. Did a lot of work there. Let's do this. Let's go back, talk a moment about. Uh, to do, to do. Talk for a moment just about why it's dot mobile. And then we'll look at how we could maybe potentially make this an app, make this a little bit more HTML5 y. Okay? So, why layout.mobile? Could it have been layout.foo? Mm -hmm. Could it have been layout.bar? I don't know. Is mobile hard coded? Let's find out. There is a thing called a display mode provider. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what this is doing. And arguably, this isn't even a mobile versus not mobile thing that we're talking about here. This is about 
modes. One could, and I'm just extrapolating here, and I'm interested in your opinion, say gold, silver, and bronze. You could. If, you know, our, co our gold customers see this. Yep. This could be a kind of theming. The other example we used when we build friendly URLs was uh, location specific. So you may have um, a .en-au to ASPX and show the Australian language version versus the American language right. version, if that was something that would work for you. Or uh, this could be an opportunity for you to change right to left yeah, if you're doing absolutely. bi-directional work. Yep. I did a lot of work for banks, and uh, if you're doing a bank in Morocco, English, French, and Arabic. Mm -hmm. So you've got three languages, two of which are left to right, right. one's right to left. Absolutely. How do you deal with that? Yep. We did a lot of stuff dynamically. Yep. In retrospect, we would use something like this. So basically, it's anything coming in off the request. So the request it obviously isn't just all I know what the browser is, it sends up language information, it sends up a whole bunch of headers like content negotiation. You could use any of those pieces of information either separately or in conjunction mm -hmm. with persistent things like cookies and session state and that type of stuff to decide what view am I going to give you now? What token am I going to add to this URL? To exactly, that? exactly. So in this example right here in the code, we're saying display mode provider and we're going to change this list of modes. There is a default one. There is a default one. It is hard-coded in the sense of it's the default. Right. But all it does, the default one, is says, uh, it would look like this. It would say mobile, and then it would basically say request.browser.isMobile. Right. And it would just basically ask if you're a mobile browser. And for most browsers, this works just fine. Mm -hmm. Basic browsers. Yeah. Um, we're not trying to keep a giant database of browsers like we used to. Right. We exactly. found that that didn't really work. Yeah. We assume most browsers scale. have JavaScript. <laughs> yeah. But it's still a really interesting piece of work, and it we'll is. talk about that. So here I'm saying there's a new display mode called WP7, and then the interesting stuff happens in this lambda right here. Basically, this is the little chunk of code that returns a true or false and says, given this context, what do you want to do? Do you want to look at the, U the, the URL? Do you want to look at the user agent in this mm -hmm. case? Yep. Do you want to look at the cookies? Do you want to look at the whatever? Right. Now, this is not something that you're going to want to spend a lot of time in. You're not going to want to make a database call in here. Mm -hmm. But if there's some piece of context mm -hmm. that a quick Boolean decision can be made about, right. I can determine whether or not this is a mobile exactly. WP7. And the reason that's get overridden user agent instead of just like get me the user agent is we had that link that lets you switch between <coughs> desktop and mobile. And what happens is when you click that, we set a cookie saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm actually going to pretend that I'm a, a mobile device now. So that, that, right. that's all handled by that little extension method there. Exactly. So this is saying, are you mobile or do you really, really want to be mobile? Right. Right. So then WP7, in that example, caused me to go down here and use layout.wp7. Nice. Or whatever. Other ideas would be um, in conjunction with responsive design but also in dealing with uh, whatever legacy issues you might have, you might say layout, layout mobile, layout tablet. Right. Yeah. Right? Or if you had a particularly complicated design, you could do portrait and landscape. Mm -hmm. you know, these are all the decisions you want to make. Now, if you were going to do things like portrait and landscape or DPI or things that are complicated that could not use CSS to make those decisions, right. couldn't use something about context, we'll give you basic information about the browser. Mm -hmm. But we can't tell you uh, whether it supports Aug Vorbis audio files. I can't tell you whether or not it supports PNGs. Right. But there are mobile partners like uh, 51 Degrees, mm -hmm. 51 Degrees.mobi, and then the Warful database, mm -hmm. W U R F L. So if you go and you plug in 51 Degrees, and they've got a database, they've got a free version and then a pay for version, they'll come in and they'll basically override those browser choices right. and give you ridiculous amounts of information. Right. You're talking about Nokia phones and yeah. rap phones and all that kind of stuff. You might want to say, does this browser support color? You know, because there are browsers that, that don't. don't. Absolutely. Does this support transparent PNGs? Does it support PNG at all? Mm -hmm. If it supports, if it doesn't support a certain thing, maybe I'm going to change it. I'm going to uh, resize things. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, let me take a look at my blog here for a second and show you an example of uh, do, do, do. let me uh, I'll use let's use DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo. Hanselman YouTube responsive. A lot of times you'll find sites that are responsive. You can see me with my right side there disappears. Mm -hmm. Who will put YouTube videos in the middle of the thing. Right. And then when it gets really, really, really small, the YouTube video just kind of gives just, up and just stays big. Yeah. 
But here's an image resizing, uh. okay? I did a video on uh, Windows 8 uh, here in YouTube. Here's my YouTube video. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, look at that. Okay. But this image, for example, is it getting smaller or is it just being resized? Oh, I don't know now. Well, it's, <laughs> it's just being resized. On the client. On the client. Right. This was on my mobile machine. Yeah. But I had to pay the price. I'm downloading all those bytes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And this can be a problem because we all want to use PNGs. Mm. They're nice, they're clean, they're transparent. But when we download those PNGs, especially for screenshots, you mm. might be bringing down three, 400K right. or right. as a megabyte. Right. And you really should, when you're doing mobile development, use PNG Out or PNG Gauntlet. Can you use PNG Gauntlet? Um, is this one of these optimization utilities? PNG Gauntlet is a joy. Awesome. It is a joy. It basically takes PNG Out or Opt to PNG and different things like that and will basically smash these PNGs and right. compress them. That gets you a little benefit when it comes to things on, uh, uh, on mobile, but not enough. Right. Ultimately, I should know the size yes. of that screen. Yep. And I can't bring down a 1280 picture on, a, on even in a retina display. Right. So the right thing to do is to use something like uh, an image resizer. And there's actually an image resizer, handsome man, on my blog here that was the new get of the package a week years ago that would allow you to take a picture like this mm -hmm. and then pass oh, in. Look at that. Information. So now you could do a bit of front end engineering with a bit of script and a bit of server side cooperation. Or and even better, on the server side, yes. On the server side, use a tool like uh, 51 Degrees. Right. Find out. And just figure out which one to send them. And send them the right image. Right. Nice. You could do this up front. Like if you had a product catalog, if you work for Sears or some big company like that, mm -hmm. you're going to want to do that all up front. Right. That's what Amazon does. They yeah. pre render a lot of those. Stick it all on an edge cache. But then Amazon recently started doing things like look inside and read this right. and put banners on it. That's yep. all dynamic. Yep. So the first time you hit it, they do it, and then they cache it. Right. You can get as complicated as you want, but that, that realization that you might need to do that yeah. is almost as powerful as the tool itself that you'd want to do. Absolutely. So talking back about um, applications, if this were to become an application, we might do it a little bit more differently. Here's the same app. Okay, works the same. Yep. Let's bring it up in another browser, bigger browser, so we can see our way around. Notice our URL. There's a tricky hash at the front of that URL. Exactly. Like see. Yeah. This is a single page application. Interesting. We've never actually left that page. Right. And this is really nice for. Uh, mobile applications because the idea is, remember each of those views that we made before, we had all dates and tags and speakers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Those views can still exist, but you could potentially make them partials. So there's speakers, yep. just a little, little chunk of data there. There's tags, there's session details. Then, ah. you Put them all together. Right. So if you did a view source, what are you going to see? A bunch of divs, all hidden. They're all going to be hidden. Yep. Then, when it comes time to show them, in this case, Steve Sanderson did this a while back. Right. He's got click events. When yep. you click on them, swap the div around. So these are fragments. These are HTML templates, basically. Yep. All he's doing is HTML templates. So what's interesting about that, from my perspective, isn't this although that's interesting. You can find a million things on the internet about that. Right. This is what's interesting. What if I took it offline? Well, this works offline. I, I won't do it here because it would uh, probably break the system. Right. But I could, well, actually, you know what I could do? Here's, check this out. Let's go into, we'll go into Chrome. I go like this. We are on uh, 36160. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ah, here we go. I'm going to go and shut down the web server. The web server. There's 36160. Yep. Okay, the web server is gone. Right. So we works. are we are now offline and still doing our work. Yep. Why? Well, what was it that got 
requested the first time we showed up. You just refreshed and the server's still not there too. Even more interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because, look at that, all data. Wow. That, we actually took all that data and returned it as JSON. Yep. Supporting a thing called cache manifest. This isn't the kind of caching that you're used to in HTTP. This is literally saying, here's kind of a bill of lading, a manifest full of stuff that you would potentially want to use. Right. And we included in that this all data. And this is one of those uh, new subsystems in HTML5 browsers that we spoke about earlier, making them really, really capable for building these rich type of applications. This is the offline cache manifest feature. Exactly. So we've got the obvious things like go and get a bunch of PNGs, make sure that this CSS is available to me. Right. But it is home slash all data that is interesting. Right. Now before in our controller we had home slash session and home slash this and home slash that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because before we're going and requesting multiple queries. But forgetting about apps for a second and forgetting even about single page applications, the philosophy of I've got an amount of data that's big but not massive. Mm -hmm. Is it reasonable to call the database every single time I go to a page when I've got this lovely virtual machine? Mm -hmm. you, know, you hear about people who have 10, machi 10 machines in the farm. You know, 10,000 users are hitting us. The 10 machines in the farm aren't able to support that. We should buy more machines. Mm. Do you have 10 machines in your farm? You have 10,000 and 10. Right. You're not using the quad processor, you know, <laughs> pocket, pocket computer. supercomputer. Yeah. You know, phones got two or three processors, four processors. Yeah. Use it. Yeah. We're not talking about a massive amount of data. No. Even if it's a couple of hundred K. Yeah. So what we do is we return that. In this case here, he's literally just saying return all the sessions as JSON. And then the work is happening on the client. So I'll check this out. Do, 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 do. So you're saying data four, data four? Yeah. Yeah. Go into here. This is kind of like link for JavaScript. You know, pluck out the speakers, flatten them, make, just get the uniques, do a sort, and return that. Nice. So that's using a library called underscore, mm -hmm. which is a very fantastic utility library for JavaScript. It's very, very popular. It's one of these base level libraries like jQuery. You can't right. use it by itself. You use it with something else. Right. And the point here is that He's thought about how he wants to build this application. This is a different way to write the same the app. The same app. It's the same app written in a different way. The server-side code is most of the same. It's still .NET code. I'm still sending stuff down to the client. Mm -hmm. But the front-end aspects are now being thought out and you know, built in a very different fashion in order to get this offline support. Right, exactly. So now we've got a nice little application that works offline. We can then give it to our conference people or uh, even, you know, to start thinking about, well, do we want to wrap it up and put it in PhoneGap or put it somewhere in, right. a, in, in an app store? So there's a lot of different ways for you to think about this stuff. But also, uh, in closing, this idea of apps versus sites. There's no hard and fast rule of thumb. Right. Although I would say data entry, uh, people in a, in a warehouse, people who are doing, I would expect that if you're going to be doing a lot of data entry, you're going to start thinking about it as being an app. Yeah. If you're going to utilize something that HTML5 just can't do. Yes. And this, this brings up the issue of plugins and Flash versus app versus web and how HTML is moving and where, you know, what happened to Silverlight. The idea is that the web keeps marching forward. Right. Plugins sit on top mm -hmm. as much as apps sit on top. Absolutely. And as soon as HTML5 and that second operating system that ships with your phone yeah. right, starts to do something that the app platform either can't do mm -hmm. or, or it's become commoditized, well, then the app developers have to... Uh, you know, rise to the occasion. Yeah, it's very interesting. There's a great video on Vimeo you can go check out. I think it's from the Sencha Touch guys. Mm -hmm. When Mark Zuckerberg said HTML5 was a mistake. Yes. We're going to go and write everything native. He written wrote everything native, and then the Sencha Touch guys said, "Well, we're going to go and write it all in our app <laughs> in our application framework as an HTML5 app." Right. And they go side by side. Yep. And it is extremely impressive. Right. So when you know what you're doing, yes, and you can learn a lot. Uh, you, HTML5 is a great little way to make a mobile application. And that is a good point. I mean, HTML5 web development has changed. It's not the same like the, the way we wrote sites 10 years ago. It really is. There's a lot of new capabilities, so you really need to rethink how these applications are built. But look at the results. I mean, look at the type of experiences you can build. Exactly. So a couple of resources, you can go up to ASP.NET slash mobile. You can learn about the Electric Plum Mobile Simulator. You can learn about 51 Degrees and other uh, 
databases for mobile browsers. Also take a look at some adaptive rendering and mobile tutorials. There's also ways to do uh, this kind of stuff in MVC3. There's some view engines and mobile view engines. You can find those on my blog. You can also learn about friendly URLs. Yep. Mobile, is now, mobile is now an ASP.NET thing. Web forms people, friendly URLs, make you mobile today. Yep. Take a look at jQuery, take a look at Kendo, take a look at Sencha. There's lots of different libraries out there. Pick the one that makes you happy. Uh, and we'll be back in a few minutes with uh, SignalR, SignalR in the real-time web. Awesome. Yes. SignalR. Yes. Thanks.